Welcome to my channel. My name is Alberto and I love history. But not the kind of history you would normally find in a textbook. I am interested in the deep structures of power. In my first book, The Freemasonic Revolutions I wrote about one of these power structures, Freemasonry. In my second book, The Banking Revolutions, I investigated about a different brotherhood, which comprised a group of international bankers. I am interested on these special episodes of history, because they give a new meaning to the history we read in the textbooks. They allow you to see the full picture. I decided that in my first video I would talk about the White House coup of 1934. Probably you didn't even know there was a failed coup in the history of the United States. At the beginning of Roosevelt's term there was an event that foreshadowed a revolution in the United States. In November of 1934 Smedley Darlington Butler, a retired general of the American Army, declared before a special committee of the Congress of the United States that a group of financiers with close ties to the Morgan Group proposed him to participate in a coup. As you probably know, in 1934 fascism was rampant in Europe. After the Great Depression many countries abandoned democracies and turned to totalitarian regimes. There were fascist regimes in countries such as Germany, Italy or Spain. But also in the United States. Americans had Roosevelt's New Deal, which was in essence a totalitarian regime, which some scholars believe was the first socialist government of the country. New Deal established a giant state, a centralized economy and an aggrandized welfare system, those were its main features. Roosevelt placed General Hugh S. Johnson to lead American industry in the National Recovery Administration, which suspended the free markets. NRA was authorized to fix prices and minimum wages, promote industrial alliances and monopolies, and suspend antitrust laws by means of codes of fair competition. General Butler was the most decorated military man in the history of the United States at the time, he was one of the two Marines to receive two Medals of Honor from Congress, and he subsequently received the Medal of Valor. As stated before, Smedley Butler testified before the special committee led by Congressman John W. McCormick and Samuel Dickstein, that elements close to the Morgan Group had offered him to lead a fascist coup in the United States. In first place, the objective was to replace Roosevelt with General Hugh Johnson, the director of the National Recovery Administration, although in a strange twist they informed Butler that Roosevelt's position had changed and the new plan would be to support him. I have summarized here the story, based on the transcript of Butler's statements before the Special Committee of the Congress Investigating Un-American Activities, 37, Congress, Second Session. November 24, 1934. The story is as follows. On July 1, 1933, retired General Smedley Butler answered a phone call from Washington inviting him to meet with veterans of the American Legion. That same day he received the visit of two maimed soldiers, Gerald C. McGuire of Massachusetts and William Doyle of Connecticut. They appeared in a black limousine with chauffeur. The soldiers talked with him for a while trying to persuade him to give a speech before other soldiers of the American Legion, at their next convention in Chicago. Butler asked how could he go without being invited, and McGuire and Doyle offered him the chance to attend as a delegate for Hawaii. The general drew the conclusion that one of the objectives of both men seemed to be to expose the administrators of the American Legion. He replied that he did not live in Hawaii, closing conversation with McGuire and Doyle with a refusal. A few days later the veterans reappeared in their limousine. They insisted that Butler should appear at the Legion Convention in Chicago. They promised to bring two or three hundred legionaries from all over the country in a train to take them to the convention. The veterans would demand that Butler speak for them and give a speech on their behalf. Make a speech about what? Butler replied. The speech was a proposal to change the American monetary system for the gold standard. Butler answered flatly. I do not know a thing about gold. He explained that no legionary he knew would be interested in paying for a trip to Chicago. McGuire and Doyle promised to pay the attending legionaries $100 or $150 for a five days trip to Chicago and back. Butler was amazed that two simple retired and handicapped soldiers came to the meeting in a chauffeured limousine and could afford such expenses. How can you pay it? You are disabled soldiers. How will you get the money to do that? To which they replied. Oh, we have friends. We will get the money. 
they exhibited a bank statement of what Butler recalled to be a total of $42,000, to show that they had contributions of considerable size. Again they said goodbye to the general with a negative response. In August, Butler met McGuire and once again he asked him about the origin of his funds. Where did you get all this money? It cannot be yours. McGuire said they received funds from nine men, donations between $2,500 and $9,000 and his goal was to take better care of the soldiers. He explained Butler that he worked for Colonel Grayson M. P. Murphy, a New York broker who had an office at 52nd Broadway. Grayson Mallet Prevost Murphy happened to be a director in the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, an industry heavily participated by Rothschilds and Rockefellers. He was a director in Guarantee Trust Co., owned by Morgan, and also in Bethlehem Steel, a shipyard owned by Morgan and one of his partners, Charles Schwab. Finally, Murphy was also chief commissioner of the American Red Cross, a charitable institution whose board of director was full of the international bankers. McGuire explained Butler that Grayson Murphy himself had put the initial $125,000 to found the American Legion and was not happy because he had not received anything in exchange for his money. Then he showed him another deposit for $64,000 in one of his accounts. But again he was unsuccessful in persuading him. On September 1, 1933, Butler went to a military convention of the 29th Division in Newark, and much to his surprise McGuire appeared again knocking on the door of his hotel room. During the conversation he left a wad of bills on his bed worth $18,000, coming from some contributions made by his mysterious benefactors. Butler replied suspicious. If I try to cash one of those $1,000 bills, you would have me by the neck. McGuire allegedly answered, We can change them into smaller denominations. It was a large sum, and Butler, suspecting that there might be some murky business behind the offer, played along with McGuire and asked him to introduce him to your superiors to know more. A few days later Butler received at his home McGuire's superior, Robert Sterling Clark, a military officer who served under General Butler's command some years ago. Clark insisted on persuading him and explained vaguely that the speech proposing the return of the United States to the gold standard was just for the veterans to collect part of their pay in gold and not in paper. He said that he had 30 million to invest and told him that his main interest was to fight for democracy. Given Butler's reluctance, Clark asked, Why do you want to be so stubborn? Why do you want to be different from other people? We can take care of you. You have got a mortgage on this house. Butler, somewhat surprised that he was aware of the state of his finances, refused once more and took him to the room where he kept all the medals and honors of his military career. Clark apparently understood the message and gave up. Butler later learned that the matter of the gold standard appeared at the American Legion Convention in Chicago, which he had decided not to attend. Far from desisting, in August of 1934 Butler received a call from McGuire, who wanted to organize a meal in Boston in honor of Butler, and he offered him $100,000 for a speech. McGuire revealed more about his true interests and explained that he had been in Italy, Spain, Germany and France studying the role of veterans in the rise of Italian and German fascism, and a French organization whose name Butler could not remember in a first moment, but that turned out to be a fascist group of French veterans called Crux du Fou. McGuire explained that Roosevelt was with his group, but that they were running out of money to finance his government and the president would not want to change the mode of financing. Butler, puzzled, asked. The idea of this great group of soldiers, then, is to sort of frighten him, is it? McGuire responded that the objective was to stage a false attack on Roosevelt. Not to frighten him. This is to sustain him when others assault him. McGuire assured Butler that he could raise an army of 500,000 men and $3 million to begin with, and up to 300 million if necessary. You know the American people will swallow that. We have got the newspaper. We will start a campaign that the president's health is failing. Everybody can tell that by looking at him, and the dumb American people will fall for it in a second. Butler probably knew that a private army was not recruited to support a democracy and he suspected that there might be something real behind the proposal of McGuire, Doyle and Clark. McGuire continued. When I was in Paris, my headquarters were Morgan and Hodges. We had a meeting over there. I might as well tell you that our group is for you, for the head of this organization. Morgan and Hodges are against you. The Morgan interests say that you cannot be trusted, that you will be too radical, and so forth. Butler pretended to be interested in the proposal. 
No, I am interested in it, but I would not head it. Butler, suspecting that nobody would believe only one testimony, sent to the offices where McGuire worked, Grayson M.P. Murphy & Co., at 52 Broadway, a man of his trust named Paul Cumley French, a reporter for the Philadelphia Record and the New York Evening Post. McGuire repeated to French the same story about analysis of fascism he did in the Germany, France and Italy cases and explained to him that a fascist system was necessary to save America from communism. McGuire spoke to French mentioning on several occasions the need for a leader like Butler, the need of a man on a white horse, adding that we might go along with Roosevelt and then do with him what Mussolini did with the King of Italy. The plan, in short, consisted in using Butler to implement a fascist state. His charisma would be enough to attract half of the American Legion and the veterans of war. Probably at some point they would get rid of Roosevelt, as Italian fascism got rid of King Victor Emmanuel III when he was no longer needed. Roosevelt was part of the group, but he was disposable. And probably Butler was disposable too. This was what Smedley Butler and Paul Cumley French stated under a sworn statement in a special committee of Congress on November 24, 1934, the so-called McCormick-Dickstein Committee. During the committee hearings, a third witness with no relation to Butler, Captain Samuel Glazier, gave a version that fit perfectly with the events described by General Butler and implied that some elements of Wall Street were preparing to establish a fascist government. Glazier was the commanding officer of a civilian conservation camp in Elkridge, Maryland. The Civilian Conservation Camps CCC, worked from 1933 until 1942 to create jobs for young unemployed American. The camps offered a subsistence wage in exchange for public works in the country. This is another example of how closely the Roosevelt's New Deal resembled other central planned economies like those of the fascist and Soviet countries. The camps lasted until enlistments for the Second World War started. Glazier, the directo of one of those camps, claimed that he had received a letter sent on behalf of General Malone to receive Jackson Martindale, a Wall Street banker. During his visit Martindale asked him several questions about the operation of his field because he was interested in building other similar work fields for industrial purposes. Martindale gave a very specific figure, 500,000 young men, and according to Glazier's statement, he came to suggest a coup in the United States. It's not irrelevant to mention that during one of the conversations with Butler McGuire offered the general to lead an army of specifically 500,000 veterans. McGuire said, I went abroad to study the part that the veteran plays in the various setups of the governments that they have abroad. I went to Italy for two or three months and studied the position that the veterans of Italy occupy in the fascist setup of government, and I discovered that they are the background. They keep them on the payrolls in various ways and keep them contented and happy, and they are his real backbone, the force on which he may depend, in case of trouble, to sustain him. But that setup would not suit us at all. The soldiers of America would not like that. I then went to Germany to see what they were doing, and his whole strength lies in organizations of soldiers, too. But that would not do. I looked into the Russian business. I found that the use of the soldiers over there would never appeal to our men. Then I went to France, and I found just exactly the organization we are going to have. Crux de Fou. Maguire told me that they, had about 500,000, and that each one was a leader of 10 others, so that it gave them 5 million votes. And he said. Now, that is our idea here in America, to get up an organization of that kind. When McGuire was called to testify, he accepted most of the version of Butler and French, he acknowledged his trips to Europe and his participation in a committee for the return to the gold standard. However, he denied the conspiracy denounced by Butler, protesting that he had always supported Roosevelt and the current leaders of the American Legion. In his statement McGuire fell into several contradictions and was not able to explain or justify by means of receipts the movements in his bank accounts worth tens of thousands of dollars. These records corroborated the dates and amounts indicated by General Butler, both the $42,000 and $64,000 receipts, and the $18,000 offered in cash. McGuire's military pension was only $37 per year but he had movements in his accounts of tens of thousands of dollars. 
The banks involved in such transactions were Manufacturers Trust Co. 13,000 were delivered to Maguire by J.K. Oliphant, the vice president of Manufacturers Trust, Central Hanover Bank, First National Bank, Siemens Bank for Savings, Chase Bank, Irving Trust, and Grayson M.P. Murphy & Company. These were the hidden benefactors of Maguire, who also confessed to having received $10,000 from the Bankers Club, the select headquarters of the Syndicate of Bankers. He finally admitted that during his travel to France he received his mail at the offices of Morgan and Hodges. On November 21, 1934 in the New York Times appeared on the cover The Coup to the White House, with the following headline, General Butler Bears Fascist Plot to Seize Government by Force, says bond salesman, as representative of Wall Street Group, asked him to lead army of 500,000 in March on Capitol. It followed, Hugh S. Johnson, former administrator of the NRA, was scheduled for the role of dictator, and that J.P. Morgan and co. were behind the plot. On November 22, literally overnight, many of the newspapers that picked up the news with great interest completely changed their treatment of the matter, showing their skepticism and relegating this information to inside pages, before Butler could present any evidence. The following New York Times headline read, Credulity Unlimited, and summarized Butler's testimony, details are lacking to lend verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. The matter was buried a few days later and it hardly received more interest from the press, giving authenticity to the statement of Maguire. You know the American people will swallow that. We have got the newspaper. The shareholding of the main media of the country was under the control of the same bankers that Butler denounced, and for no apparent reason happened to insult the general who years before had won. Going into detail on the question of who controls the media in the United States would be an excessively extensive task, but it is enough to take, for example, the two most influential newspapers in the country, the Washington Post today belongs to the descendants of Eugene Meyer, a banker who bought it in bankruptcy in 1933. He was not only the owner, but also the president and editor. And who was Meyer? He was a banker with Lazard Frères a banking institution in which his father had been a partner. In 1918 he was first executive director of the War Finance Corporation, in 1930 chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and in 1946 the first president of the World Bank. It was virtually impossible for the Post to maintain an editorial line contrary to the great banking fraternity. Something similar happened with the New York Times. In 1896 Adolf Simon Ox acquired a newspaper in a financial situation as ruinous as the Post. Morgan secured funding for Ox to get hold of the newspaper. The Ox Salzberger family has remained in control of the chief New York Journal until today. This is actually the story of almost all newspapers today, operating in a sector with a large number of competitors, low profitability and where their survival depends on combining their editorial line with the economic interests of their shareholders, various political groups and its advertisers. The McCormick Dickstein Committee, just like the American press, seemed to take a hard breaking, and the next day they determined that there was no reason to call to testify to personalities involved like Thomas W. Lamont, Grayson M. P. Murphy or General Hugh Johnson. The testimony of a war hero and American army general with 33 years of active service seemed insufficient to be taken into account by the media and by the investigation committee. What did a military officer, of an irreproachable character, had to gain, already retired and without any political ambition? Not enough attention has been paid to Butler's testimony, and when it has been mentioned, it has been posed as a failed coup attempt against Roosevelt, although this is entirely incorrect. As explained to Butler, Roosevelt was with the group of bankers, and although at first they thought to do without him to implement his fascist government, then they reconsidered his position. I said, what do you want to do with it when you get it up? Well, we want to support the president. I said, the president does not need the support of that kind of an organization. Since when did you become a supporter of the president? The last time I talked to you were against him. Well, he is going to go along with us now. Well, what are you going to do with these men, suppose you get these 500,000 men in America? What are you going to do with them? Well, they will be the support of the president. I said, the president has got the whole American people. Why does he want them? Don't you understand the setup has got to be changed a bit? Now, we have got him, we have got the president. 
He has got to have more money. There is not any more money to give him. 80% of the money now is in government bonds, and he cannot keep this racket up much longer. He has got to do something about it. He has either got to get more money out of us or he has got to change the method of financing the government, and we are going to see to it that he does not change that method. He will not change it. When Maguire spoke of we, he was referring to Grayson Murphy and the financial interests that he represented. Did certain American financial interests related to Morgan supported the establishment of a totalitarian regime on America? It does not seem unreasonable at all, particularly if we take in consideration that these were the same bankers who supported fascism and communism. I investigate in detail about it in my second book, The Banking Revolutions. By reading between the lines Butler's statement, we can fathom the missing pieces in this story, which seems to be somehow convoluted. The triumph of Roosevelt was the result of the support of that financial element that in his own words dominated the government since the days of Andrew Jackson. Shortly after becoming president, in 1933, Roosevelt tried to turn his back on the Anglo-Germanic banking system that rose him to the presidency, and he tried to go on his own. Determined to recover the money invested in Roosevelt, the international bankers considered forming a group of veterans across the country, led by Butler, to put a little fear of Roosevelt and make him reconsider his position. If this plan didn't work, perhaps Plan B would establish in the United States a fascist dictatorship led by someone more docile like General Hugh S. Johnson, the administrator of the NRA, the economic program set by Roosevelt which was already a proto-fascist system. Roosevelt therefore was not the victim of the bankers, but a vassal who at some point tried to bite the hand that fed him. He finally reconsidered his position and decided to go along with the bankers again. Or maybe the bankers simply ran out of money and thought that it would be more profitable for them to put an end to the New Deal's democratic fiction and establish a dictatorship in the United States. When the issue was publicly known Roosevelt did not take any reprisals against the bankers, possibly because doing so would be against their own interests. In January 1935 a journalist of the socialist newspaper The New Masses, John L. Spivak, denounced that a substantial part of French and Butler's testimony was removed from the final text of the McCormick-Dickstein Committee. In essence, they removed parts that directly involved President Roosevelt in tune with the coup group General Hugh S. Johnson, responsible for the NRA and various business interests, including, James H. Perkins, president of the National City Bank, John W. Davis, lawyer at the law firm specialized in banking Davis, Polk and Wardwell, and general counsel of the United States, ambassador to the United Kingdom, Democratic candidate for president in 1924 and director of the Council of Foreign Relations, Remington & Co., a firearms company owned by the DuPonts, which was expected to provide the army with the necessary credit, weapons and military equipment. Congressman John W. McCormick acknowledged in a letter to Spivak that a part of the testimonies were deleted from the final committee text. It is possible that Butler would have confused, exaggerated or even fabricated a part of the story, but his action could also have aborted the establishment of a fascist government in the United States by making public his conversations with those involved. A coup sponsored by international bankers, working hand in hand once again. We end this video a small speech that Butler recorded for the television, denouncing the failed coup that he probably had stopped. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on a Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institutions. I want to retain the right to vote, I have the right to speak freely, and the right to write. 
If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. Remember you can find very useful information about this and other interesting episodes of history in my books The Banking Revolutions and The Freemasonic Revolutions. If you like my work please like, subscribe, or buy my books at Amazon.